Modern judicial systems typically revolve around well-dressed, highly paid, low-life attorneys arguing over facts, law, and evidence before a judge and jury. But the Icelandic judicial system of the Middle Ages? It revolved around vengeance, animosity, honor, and the complex world of Viking blood feuds. Yeah! Today, we're going to take a look at the Icelandic Vikings justice system that was based on blood feuds. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other Viking-related topics you would like to hear about. Okay, we're going to court, the Vikings court. <laughs> to the Icelandic Vikings, the word justice was understood to refer to revenge and retribution, both of which in turn were intricately bound up in very specific notions of honor kind of like with the Klingons from Star Trek. A Viking was expected to forcefully respond to an injury, robbery, or unfair business deal, and a failure to do so risked a costly loss of honor. In cases where the offended party was slain, it became the duty of their kinsmen to respond to the decedent's behalf. Failing to avenge a slain kinsman was considered dishonorable, but it wasn't as easy as just hunting down the offender and claiming whatever bloody revenge your heart desired. Honor demanded vengeance was taken appropriately. For example, a group of men attacking a lone offender was considered dishonorable because revenge was always to be exacted in as fair a manner as possible. The justice system of the 9th through the 11th century Iceland looked completely different than what any of us are used to today. There was nothing like a marshal or police force and there was no centralized legal system to decide how to deal with criminals. Instead, Justice was enacted through cooperative communal action, and disputes were resolved by rules that developed through custom and tradition. In this context, it mostly fell on the offended party looking to avenge their fallen kinsmen to pursue satisfaction. Composed in the late 13th century by an unknown author, Njal Saga recounts the story of a decades-long blood feud that caused hostile clashes and ultimately brought familial dishonor to all involved. As it unfolds, the members of two kin groups are slowly drawn into a cycle of slaying, remuneration, and revenge. From a historical perspective, the events of the saga teach us about some of the rules and customs that govern such blood feuds. One crucially important rule that had to be observed when avenging a lost kinsman was to make the slaying and the reason for it very public. Accusations didn't require an investigation or even evidence, but publicizing allowed for an offended party to later defend the slaying as a legally protected reaction to the wrongs they had endured. A properly publicized slaying was considered manslaughter. Not reporting, however, could result in the much more serious declaration of morth, or murder. The distinction between murder and manslaughter was key to the process. Murder lacked honor and implied a shameful act that was likely committed without giving the opposing party a chance to defend themselves. Manslaughter, on the other hand, signaled that reconciliation was possible and that the target's kinsmen at least had a chance to react to the charges and rectify the situation. It also implied that the aggrieved party was willing to answer for their offense. Blood feuds were based on reciprocity. This means that when a slaying took place and was properly made public, the target's kinsmen had two basic ways they could respond. On the one hand, they could seek out the slayer and kill him in revenge, always an attractive option for your average Viking. On the other hand, they could demand the payment of war guild, or man price, which was also sometimes called blood money. This was also an attractive option since who among us doesn't have a few relatives they would happily trade for a bag of silver. At the beginning of Njal's saga, Njal's wife, Berg Thora, exchanges harsh words with his friend Gunnar's wife, Halgareth. The husbands were friendly, but their wives didn't like each other. One day, Halgareth sends one of her servants to kill one of Berg Thora's servants. After the slaying, Njal, over the objections of his wife, accepts silver as blood money and rejects the chance for retaliation. Angered, Berg Thora sends another servant to kill one of Halgareth's servants, which results in Njal just paying the same amount of silver right back to Gunnar. These events illustrate the interchangeability of revenge slayings and the payment of blood money, as well as why being a servant in Viking-era Iceland could be a tough gig. Revenge slayings and payments of blood money were the preferred options for ending a blood feud, but they weren't the only outcomes that were possible. 
If things didn't proceed as they were meant to, a feud could also end in the physical banishment of an offender. Vikings who failed to follow the rules of feuding and committed a morph could expect to be sentenced to what was known as outlawry. This meant they would be exiled for a period that could last anywhere from three years to the rest of their lives. That's a big range. Despite being considered exiles, those with a lifetime ban were strictly forbidden from leaving the country. Rather, they were expected to stay and live as outcasts. And if that wasn't bad enough, they could also be hunted by others with impunity. This meant that for all intents and purposes, outlawry was often tantamount to a death sentence. Composed by an unknown author at the end of the 14th century, the saga of Grettir the Strong tells the story of his titular hero, Grettir, who spends decades as an outlaw. After having adventures in Norway, he eventually finds his way back home, only to be outlawed again for another crime. This saga highlights how punitive isolation and exclusion was to Icelanders. Letting a dispute turn into an unending cycle of vengeance was usually a losing proposition for everyone involved. The chaos associated with such long conflicts often led to a social stigma that could prove isolating. Allies might withdraw support and safe passage across their lands from such families, which would threaten free movement throughout the island. This, in turn, threatened participation in important political and social gatherings. In a society held together by precarious rules and alliances, it was a dangerous position to be in. The blood feuds also had a way of drawing more and more kinsmen in as they dragged on. These exponential escalations threatened crucial economic activities. They meant time away from watching livestock, cultivating the land, and preparing for the cold months ahead. The Icelandic Vikings weren't totally without a government, though. Generally speaking, representatives of the individual regions of Scandinavia would meet periodically and assemble into bodies very descriptively called things. These things would resolve disputes and vote on sentences for criminals. Any disputes that couldn't be settled at the local and regional things would be passed up to a vaguely Supreme Court-like network of chieftains. This network could have been called something awesome like the Ultimate Viking Blood Feud Council, but instead they decided to call it the Althing. You have to respect their branding. Headed up by a law speaker, the Althing worked to hear disputes, make new laws, and decide general matters of government. They of course didn't call them a law speaker, they had their own word for it, which is up on your screen right now. I'll let you take a moment and try to pronounce that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Oh, well, thanks for trying. As depicted in Njal's saga, individuals from throughout Iceland would come together at the Althing, which would serve as a mediator between feuding kin groups. During one gathering described in the saga, Gunnar's wife, Halgerth, sends a slave to steal from a local farmer who is at a meeting with her husband. The theft leads to a confrontation in which Gunnar kills the farmer and his companions. The dispute winds up before the Althing, where it's resolved by financial means. The peace is re-established, at least for a while. Archaeologists have determined that Icelandic kin groups could be surprisingly complex. Often, they weren't even actually based on blood. Relations by marriage, foster children, and illegitimate siblings were all involved. And there might have been a very, very good reason for that. Namely, evidence shows that killers typically had significantly more kin than their victims. The implication is that larger kin groups provided a sense of protection and support that allowed their members to be bolder about instigating blood feuds. Those with small groups to protect them were more vulnerable, which meant kinless men could be eliminated without a significant risk of retaliation. There were other advantages to having wide networks of kinsmen, one involved appearing before the Althing. Whenever the chieftains, or Kothar, that's a pretty good guess at a pronunciation, were in attendance, they brought retainers with them known as Thingmen. The more a given chieftain extended his social and political power, the more Thingmen he would be allowed, potentially totaling in the hundreds. When the powerful chieftains Hafli Mason and Thorgils Odesson appeared before the Althing in 1121, they are said to have had 1,440 and 940 Thingmen, respectively. Big entourages made big impressions. Some things never change. While the Icelandic Viking sagas tell us much about blood feuds, their ultimate attitude toward the practice is debatable. In fact, it's widely accepted that the sagas could be viewed, at least in part, as cautionary tales that warn against endless destructive cycles of violence. 
This is especially notable in Njal's saga, where Gunnar and Njal fail to escape their own cycle of vengeance. The shortcomings of the feuding process are illustrated by the escalation of the conflict, which eventually ends in disaster. Gunnar is ultimately betrayed by his wife and slain by men attacking his home, while Njal is burned along with his family in a different act of revenge. However, as author William Pensack notes in his book, The Conflict of Laws and Justice in the Icelandic Sagas, Njal's saga was written in the 13th century after the All Thing was abolished. That being the case, the story may actually be purposefully arguing that the blood feud system was demonstrably inferior to the system that replaced it. That is, by drawing attention to all the feuds and murders that raged during the era of the All Thing, the saga implicitly highlighted the superiority of the new Christian monarchy. So what do you think? Would you have liked to live under the Vikings justice system? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.